Good evening, everybody, to the uh, second sort of public webinar for the Olympus Educator Group. I'm Joe Ellis, a wedding and portrait photographer out of Dallas, Texas, and we're excited to have you guys tonight to kind of give you some tips that we've come up with, just fun things to kind of add to your, uh, your uh, abilities here with your Olympus cameras and talk about some of our specific genres and kind of how we use the equipment that we have. What we'd like to do tonight is kind of three quick rounds of information, and um, we really want to encourage you guys to add questions to the chat if you want to. Uh, we will have an open Q&A at the end. And if you would like to ask a question on video, then raise your hand here on Zoom and uh, Matt Seuss will find you and we will get you live on camera asking some questions for us. So the first round here is just gonna be some quick introductions, sort of an elevator pitch from each of us, from each of us so that you can know a little bit about who we are. And then I will go through two rounds of uh, tips that we've come up with that we wanna share this evening. And again, if you have questions, please, please hit us up. So uh, first up here on elevator pitches are the McDonald's, Joe and Mary Ann, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Mary Ann McDonald. And I'm Joe McDonald. And we live in central Pennsylvania in a place we call Hoot Hollow. We lead photo tours and workshops all around the world. We teach workshops here at our house and in Hoot Hollow. Um, we're nature and wildlife photographers. So we've been doing this for, uh, for, I've been doing it for about since 1985 or so, so a long time. So we're welcome, or we're happy to be involved in this tonight. Cool, very good. Over to you, Joe. <laughs> oh yes, I guess I'm second. Um, my name is Joe Ellis. I'm a wedding and portrait photographer in Dallas, Texas. And uh, I basically do a lot of my education through YouTube. So if you're looking for YouTube tutorials on uh, people and event photography, look me up there. It's Joseph Ellis Photographer on YouTube. You can also find my wedding work at josephmark.com. And uh, that's basically how I got involved with this group. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some tips with you guys. Let's move on to Lidra. Hey, everybody. My name is Lidra Woodley. I um, basically, what I do with my life is I run photography workshops all over the country, locally here in North Georgia. I'm, that's where I live is North Georgia mountains. And um, I'm the owner of Natural Connections Photo Workshops. And um, if you're curious about doing any traveling and, and taking photos of really great places, please check me out. Uh, my website is naturalconnectionsphoto.com, and um, I'll have some tips for you guys a little, la little later. Perfect. Uh, Tom and Lisa, up next. Tom and I are actually in uh, two different <laughs> rooms right now, but uh, we do our photography together, and we actually met through photography. Um, we do a lot of workshops. We present a lot of presentation for camera clubs and photo groups around the country. You can find us at photographybylisaandtom.com. And we really love to teach people, inspire people. Our motto is creativity is contagious, and we want to pass it on. So thank you. And please keep in mind, everybody, we'll try and put notes on these things. Uh, and we have a Facebook page, an Olympus Educators Facebook page that we would love to have you guys find where we'll put some notes and uh, links to these things if you're looking for any of us. You can also find us at the Get Olympus site under the Educators tab uh, under Learn. So Get Olympus backslash Learn. Okay, uh, next up is Matt out in Montana. Hey guys, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. I am Matt Seuss. I'm up in Bozeman, Montana, and I've been a professional photographer for over 30 years now, starting in photojournalism, but I specialize in landscape and nature and wildlife and uh, night sky photography as well. You can check me out online at learn.mattseuss.com, M-A-T-T-S-U-E-S-S. -S. I normally run a bunch of field workshops, but with the whole COVID, um, obviously those have gotten pushed back till next year, but I do have a list on my website and uh, check it out too, because I'll be launching a really intensive, really cool online photo workshop uh, that'll be coming out next month. So I uh, can't give you too many details right now, but uh, head out to my website and I got a newsletter sign up for you there. Awesome. All right, next up, we're running out to Seattle for Lisa and John. Hi everybody and welcome. I'm Lisa Merrill. Hi, I'm John. And when we're not in Bellevue, Washington, we also lead photo tours uh, and hope to do it next year. We postponed both Vietnam and India and the Pacific Northwest will be offering day trips this summer and also weekends throughout the year. Love being part of this group. And when we're not uh, teaching, we do travel photography. That's been our passion for 25 years telling the essence of a place and its people. And you can check us out at merrillimages.com. Perfect. And next up is Rob. 
Oh, wait, Rob didn't make it in. So on to Eric. Maybe Rob will join us later, but we got Eric Rock coming up to you next. Hi, this is Eric Rock um, calling in from Fashion Island, Washington. And uh, just to let you know that I've got a background in nature and photography. I've been leading nature tours and photo tours for coming up on 30 years now. And uh, I'm, working, I'm working now for Joseph Van Ross Photo Safaris leading and developing photo tours around the world. You can check us out at uh, an easy one, photosafaris.com. Perfect. Well, that was easy, guys. Nice job. All right. So we're going to start some rounds of tips here. And as oh, wait, ATD, Victor's on. Oh, Victor's on. Okay, great. Victor's up. Yep. He was. Uh oh, maybe he left. <laughs> nope, I guess not. <laughs> if any of the other educators jump on during this, just somebody holler at me and we'll get back to them. All right, so we're headed into round one of tips. And like I said, if you guys have questions for the um, presenter on the tip, then please uh, either type them in the chat or if you um, raise your hand here on Zoom, then we'll try and get you on video to ask a question right at the end of their tip. So first up here is Joe McDonald. Well, hello. Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, first is Pro Capture, and Pro Capture is one of the features that the uh, the Mark cameras have, the M1X, the Mark III, the Mark II. And if you haven't tried Pro Capture, you've got to do it. If you're a wildlife photographer, it is uh, an absolute game changer. However, the thing about it that's uh, important to know: in traditional a action capturing shooting, if you will. Uh, you're, you're going for the peak moment and you fire at that point. And with pro capture, you actually want to be slow on the draw so that the peak action, you're actually missing it. But the pro capture, which captures as many as 35 frames before or uh, pre-shutter release, if you will, that um, if you fire a little late, you'll get the shots as the subject is, let's say a bird taking off from a branch. And when you first start doing it, or even if you've been doing it for a while, what you might find is that you're firing as soon as the action happens, just as you would with you know, a traditional action capturing shooting. And when you do that, you'll, you'll kind of lose the effect because uh, let's take a bird, for example, a bird's on a perch, where's it in my hand? Bird's on a perch, and it takes off and you fire as soon as that happens. Well, what you would do then is you would get 30, maybe 30 shots of it sitting on that branch and just two or three as it's taking off out of the uh, frame. What you wanna do is have your bird there and when it takes off, shoot then and you'll get all these shots coming back to the, uh, the, the point of origin. And uh, so you don't wanna be like, prematurely shooting, if you will. Uh, yeah, we have images. And the, um, the other thing on it too is for pro capture, you're on the electronic shutter, not the mechanical shutter. So you can go up to at least 20,000th, maybe even 32,000th of a second, which is really like high speed flash photography. So in order to get a shutter speed of 16,000th or 20,000th or 32,000th, you have to have a higher ISO. And you wanna be shooting wide open, like F4 if you're using a 300 millimeter lens. And I'm typically shooting at uh, like 16,000th of a second when I'm doing this. So my ISO is rarely at 800. It's more frequently at like 1600 or 3200. And uh, there might be a little bit of noise at, at that higher one, but the action that you're capturing is, is well worth the trade-off. So two points. Be, uh, don't be a premature shooter. Let it action actually happen and then fire. And jack up your ISO if you need to so that you can have a very, very fast shutter speed. I was just with a friend, and I, was, I didn't mention to him. Uh, he's an experienced shooter, so I, didn't, I wasn't coaching him. And uh, he was shooting at ISO 800 and had maybe a 2,000th of a second. And we were shooting chipmunks. And I was up at like 1,600 or 3,200. And I was getting 16,000th of a second shutter speeds. He was doing 2,000. 
my shots were razor sharp. Uh, I caught the action, froze it. His were blurred. And it's surprising that a chipmunk can explosively jump like that, but they can. So you want to use a fast shutter speed. Hey, Joe, I have two questions Lisa, for you. Did you show the images? Or are they up? They're up. OK. So the painted two. bunning there and uh, the blue gross beak were both shot in that pro capture. And the actual shot that, uh, uh, that when I fired the shutter, both of those subjects, the painted bunning and that blue gross beak, were out of the frame at that point. But stepping back in history, I had a whole series of them as it's, the birds were either taking off from the water or that water hole or from the log where they were feeding. Hey, Joe, I've got two questions. Uh, do you give it a full second count before you fire? Like, how much time are we talking about lag no, there? Because, and also. Uh, I'll answer that one first. You don't give it a, a full second. You actually just want to kind of shoot just a little bit slow on the draw. Uh, and, and really, like if you're doing a bird that's launching from a, uh, a perch, uh, especially a songbird, if you fire almost as soon as it, it uh, takes off, you're already too late uh, because the, the bird's moving so quickly that it'll be out of the frame. But in that, that capture of 35 free uh, pre-shutter release shots, you'll get it as it's coming up. But if you waited a whole second, this thing is shooting at, um, I think up to like 60 frames a second. So if you gave it a full second, you might, the bird would be on Mars by then and all you'd get would be a, a blank space. So just a hair trigger slower is all you're saying. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit slow. Gotcha, okay. And then isn't there some uh, differences in autofocus and things between uh, low and high with pro capture there is but I, I i found that it's almost immaterial for this because what you want to be getting is the shot as it's exploding and you're it, this is moving so quickly that i don't think any autofocus system would be able to follow a songbird that's like explos exploding explosively leaping up out of a water hole or off of a perch so uh, I, I often use Pro Capture High, and if the bird moves a little bit before it launches, I just toggle the shutter so that I have uh, it's continually in focus. But it's okay. important to hold that shutter halfway down so it's recording that whole time, and you have that little rotating wheel that shows that you're in Pro Capture as you're doing that. Cool. All right. Matt, any questions coming across there, or should we move on to the next? No, tip? no, no more questions on that. I think Joe did a great job explaining that. Too thorough, and, uh, if yeah. anyone, <laughs> yeah, if anyone does have any questions uh, later on, we're going to have an open session at the very end too. So uh, yeah, go right ahead, Joe. All right, awesome. So uh, my first tip tonight, guys, is actually on face detect. And Lisa, yeah, you can move over to this frame because it kind of gives a nice bunch of references here. So the first part A of face detect that I want to mention, if you have not gotten into it, is that if you have an EM5 Mark III, an EM1 Mark II, an EM1 Mark III, or an EM1X, your face detect capabilities when you're shooting video have vastly expanded since the first cameras, since the EM1 Mark II was introduced. And if you shoot video on the fly, whether you're vlogging style or shooting pictures of, or shooting video of your kids or just someone is in front of you, the continuous AF with face detect works really, really well in video. And I think that's a huge improvement for Olympus cameras on this front. And I shoot a lot of video with my Olympus cameras, whether I'm shooting events or weddings or just my own family. And I find I'm using face detect a lot of the time for that. So that's tip number one for part A is video. If you have one of those cameras, so it's sort of EM1 Mark II and newer on the upper line, then your face detect continuous AF for video is a wonderful, wonderful tool. Now, part B is specific just to the EM1 Mark III, and that is that if you want to shooting stills with your EM1 Mark III and you're using continuous autofocus and you're shooting people like I do, then the face detect feature on that camera works really, really well. In the past, when we were using CAF to like shoot people running towards us, for example, or walking towards us, we would be in regular continuous autofocus, but not be using the face detect because it would oftentimes jump around or miss things or not be very sticky. But now with the EM1 Mark III, I can actually leave my camera in position and it will track a face across the frame no matter where it goes. And that includes things like my daughter, like uh, rollerblading towards me or my son playing sports or a bride walking down the aisle. 
And with the EM1 Mark III in all of those conditions, I can rely on the face detect to not only find the face, probably in, a, in order of magnitude better than the EM1 Mark II or earlier cameras, talking five or 10 times better. It'll pick up a face, it'll stick to it for continuous autofocus. So what I tend to do is put my back button focus on the camera, hammer down, and you'll notice, um, as Joe was talking on the last tip, he was talking about the wheel on the right-hand side of the frame um, that was uh, indicating whether you're in pro capture. When you're in continuous autofocus, the way the camera's alerting you to the fact that you have got perfect focus on a point that you're pointed at is a little green dot on the corner of the screen. That green dot indicates that it's tracking and, and is continually making the image sharp. So what I will do for tons and tons of people photos in continuous autofocus is I'll have my camera in back button focus, I'll have my face detect turned on, and I'll have my hammer down on the back button. And, and no matter what happens, the camera sticks to the face, and I simply use the trigger to pull off frames of people as they're running, jumping, moving, walking towards me. Absolutely love face detect autofocus. Makes my job so much easier because I can concentrate on the edges of my frame, I can concentrate on the action, and my hands and my fingers are doing far less than they used to in previous models. So that's a big upgrade with the EM1 Mark III. But if you have any cameras previous to that and you shoot video, definitely, definitely check out Face Detect and continuous autofocus in video. That's my first tip, guys. Awesome. We have uh, no questions on that from uh, everyone else, but I'm going to, I'll throw a couple of questions at you. Uh, and yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, Joe. I mean, the Face Detect is awesome. I think both of us actually probably have um, Olympus cameras hooked up right now for this presentation, right? Um, I'm, I'm using a Mark II right now on my, uh, so you're seeing me through a Mark II right now and I have that on the face to tech. Uh, so my question is what happens when you have people at different focus planes and you wanna focus on one person versus the other? What's the camera gonna do and what do you have to do to, to worry about that and take control yeah. of that? Well, see the first way you know what you're doing is that there's a special type of box and you can see it in this photo here that shows which face is selected. And it's kind of a square with little corners that are illuminated to tell you which face it's chosen. In the EM1 Mark III, you can actually assign another button on the camera to do the face selection. And by holding down that button and rotating the back command wheel, you can say move between faces in the frame. Now for me, if you're working in an event and you're working really quickly, I tend to actually have face detect programmed to a custom button. And if for any reason I, I turn the camera, I'm no longer pointed at a person, or if the camera were to lose a face because it turned away from me, then I would simply turn the uh, face detect off with a button on the front of the camera. And that allows me to revert back to my, my normal focus modes if I need to in a heartbeat, which makes it very quick and efficient for me. So you can use either the face selector to pick which face you want, or you can simply turn it on and off if you have any problems with it. Awesome. All right, we have uh, no other questions came in yet. So uh, Joe, go right ahead to the next person. All right, I'm excited to hear from Lidra. Tip number one. Hey, okay. So the first thing I want to talk to you guys about today is going to be um, the custom modes on the top of the camera. This is actually a really, really um, great feature that the Olympus engineers have put in here. Most of the pro cameras out there have this, and I was really happy when, they, when my camera started having this. Um, what, why this is useful for me, I am mostly a landscape nature sort of, you know, just sort of landscapey photographer. Um, I'm out going to be out shooting barns or trees or mountains or lakes or something like that. And I'm going to be shooting just sort of just regular shooters, you know, shooting on manual with regular normal landscape settings uh, dialed in. But what happens when a bear walks out from behind a barn? or a coyote such as this guy walks out from the, um, from, you know, from behind the house that I was shooting at that day. Um, this is something that I actually have all of my students when I'm on a workshop where there could be wildlife around, I actually have everyone set up a custom function, a C1 button on top of the camera. And um, you'll actually hear me yelling during a workshop, C1, C1, if something like that happens, because you know you want to be able to get that image of something amazing like a coyote or a bear or a moose or something like that, if it just happens to pop out, but you're not always gonna have the settings dialed in. So basically what the custom function is, is that you dial in every single one of your, fun, your um, selections for what you would be doing with wildlife photography. And you save it to any one of these, C1, C2, C3, or C4. And um, if something walks out, you just 
quickly throw it on top and you start blasting away. And so that's actually what happened with this coyote here. Um, he just walked out from behind a barn that I was shooting for landscape and I threw it on C1 and I was able to get the, to get this in, you know, sharp and uh, in focus. So um, that is one thing that now all, not all the cameras have this on top, but all of the cameras for Olympus do have something called my set as well. So if you don't have one of the pro cameras that has a C1, C2, C3, or something like that on top, you can go into the my set and the menus set the same exact thing up. And what I've always done is take that my set and assign it to a button because there's, you can assign so many things to these buttons and you, one of your my sets is one of those things. So if you don't have a C1, you can still assign the custom function to, to a button if something happens quickly and you still have access to it without having to dig into the menu. So um, that's the beauty of the custom functions because um, you don't have to miss a shot if it suddenly happens for you. So Lisa, if it's something sudden like that, are you setting up your C1 for something like almost sort of like an automatic program kind of thing? No. Or are they set up really specific for like, we're, we're gonna look, think, look for bears today, so these are my bear settings. Yeah, well, anything moving. So, I mean, even if it's children running, it's the same settings for me. So, you know, I'm gonna have a certain ISO dialed in to make sure I have a fast enough shutter speed. I normally shoot it fairly wide, wide open so the camera does give me a fast enough shutter speed. I'm gonna have it on low burst mode. I'm going to have, you know, have all of, all of those things dialed in as if I were going to shoot wildlife that day. Okay. So, so it's like a, a moving versus still kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it's normally I'm, I, since I do landscape, I'm, I'm really working with still inanimate objects, but when something like this guy comes out of the woods, you want to be able to throw it onto your settings quickly and not even think about it and just start blasting. So, and that's what happens. Um, <laughs> Often, uh, a lot of my workshops, animals show up, and I always have my C1 uh, dial. I love that you're screaming at your attendants, C1! <laughs> I, I yell, and they all go, oops, and so they all turn it to C1 and start blasting away. That's how they get the shot. So, Lee, awesome. we, we actually it. do the exact same thing, but we call it our Bigfoot mode. We say, Bigfoot walks out, and you were focus stacking. You want to make sure yeah. you get the picture yeah. of Bigfoot. But we you say the exact same thing. Really quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Nope, we, we do exactly the same thing. <laughs> I'll tell you, awesome I haven't tip. even used those custom functions yet, but I'm, I'm totally dialing in on this one here. I'm going to set my camera up now for this because that, that's an awesome tip. All right, Matt, anything uh, you I need there? That too, just, just to add to that, uh, I have, like C4 is, uh, I think, manual for me, uh, my manual setting. C3, I think, is pro capture. And I do it four to three because sometimes I'll, the video button is, uh, if you're going to go on video, is adjacent to four. So if I, I do a lot of video, so I can flip back and forth between C4 and video. And then if I'm doing a, a pro capture, I go to C3. Yeah, Joe, I do the same thing. My C1 is my normal wildlife moving subject. And then I do C2. The only difference is that I've got pro capture dialed in. So mm -hmm. I have both of those so easy to get to if um, some animal action is happening. One way to what sort I, what of I do set on up that here. Too, with that, is uh, I'll continually like update it because you know the lighting can change and I might be shooting late in the evening and if I go to C say C1 or C4 and the it's set for the mid afternoon shooting I I really didn't gain anything so I'll update it and just go to the the uh, assign the custom function and just re reset it if you will. Cool. All right, guys. I love it. So uh, I guess we're moving on here unless uh, Matt's got anything he needs. Uh, let's go mm, to no. go ahead. Tom. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Tom. Uh, Lisa's in another room. And um, thank you guys for showing up. Um, here's, this is a good tip. Uh, daylight live composite. We were out in uh, Death Valley, the southern end. The southern end. And uh, with the daylight live composite, it's kind of counterintuitive for a lot of people, you know, but one of the biggest tips I can give you is use the low ISO, uh, high f-stop like an f-22 or if you can go higher. I would use uh, a, um, you know, a neutral density filter, the highest one you can find. And what's nice about the uh, Olympus camera, I'm sorry, we I have two Springer Spaniels. <laughs> There's some construction going on. Come here, Kodak. Um, sorry. <laughs> Anyway, my, um, the live composite is great if you use it during the day. 
I apologize. <laughs> Come here, girls. Got a couple of fans of live composite over there. I <laughs> uh, yep, yep, and I, I think I need to use Pro Capture on these guys. That, that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but live composite, the the trick is is you can set your your live composite time in the live composite mode to like a half a second, one second. That is that is the trick. It can it takes a little experimenting, but you can get through it really nice and easy. Um, sometimes I combine a polarizer on my neutral density filter to kind of give a little more pop in the sky. Some of the, these shots were taken in uh, the Palouse and uh, down Chincoteague. And uh, this is a picture that Lisa took a while ago out in Rhode Island. And live composite at night work, works really, really well with lighthouses. And th that white streak on the horizon is an actual barge that came by. But one of the benefits is, is you can get your exposure on the brightest part of the scene. It'll capture that. And then as, as the uh, new light comes in, which is, use, which is the stars, so you can see the stars just kind of building up, building up in your camera. And it's, it's just a wonderful thing and very motivating to see this all taking place right in front of your eyes rather than waiting till you turn off the camera and then go back home and have to re-edit it. And it, it, can, it makes photography a lot more fun at night with the exception of the bugs. Hey Tom, one of the keys to this frame is finding the North Star, right? Yes, yes. How do you go about doing that in these kind of images? That's a good question, and Lisa is the one who taught me that. <laughs> so we actually, um, if you if you look at the Olympus Passion magazine, we actually had an article, and this was the cover of the magazine that month, and it actually shows how to find the North Star by finding the Big Dipper, and it actually <laughs> little arrows in there. And I think during COVID, those issues of Olympus Passion magazine are all free. I think it was the January issue, but I think they gave everybody like six months free of the Olympus Passion magazine. So they're is an article up there that walks through exactly how to do that. Cool. And, and if you forget about the Big Dipper, just take a test shot and you know leave the shutter open for a few minutes and then see which way the direction the stars are moving and then just make a little bit of adjustment on your next photo. One of the nice things about the Olympus camera system is, is the live boost. At night, you can literally see all the ambient light that you would normally see if you bumped up your ISO to 6400 and did your test shot. You can literally see and compose on the fly. And that's a really, really important feature that we really like. And again, it's going back to making photography a lot of fun and enjoying the experience and capturing what your mind's eye sees. Awesome, I love it. Okay, moving right along. So let's go see, right ahead, Joe. Um, is Mary, Mary Ann is next. Yep. Well, I, we, before when we were talking, I forgot to mention that our um, website is www.hoothollow.com. And like everybody else, we are have everything rescheduled for next year, 2022. So you can check out what all we'll be doing um, starting next February. Now, my tip is a much more general tip. I love to teach composition because I think that photography is an art form. And if you can have a few little rules or things to look for, you can enhance your images. One of my mantras is, if you can't make it good, make it big. But if you can't make it big, make it better. So in my this first image that you're seeing, I was looking for leading lines. I'm down in the Falkland Islands working with some old whale bones on the beach on one of the islands. So I try to use the rib bone as kind of a leading line and diagonal into the vertebrae. Um, at least if you go to number two, you'll see why I did it this way. I was working with the rule of thirds or the points of power. Um, and in that you divide or you divide your, your image into thirds um, by, two. by two lines, by two vertical and two horizontal and where those lines intersect, that's your point of power. Um, as you can see right now. So I was trying to put the vertebrae up into that point of power with the rib kind of leading up to it. Now we always say about, we, we try to get people in our workshops to use their, their tripods because you can have more time to compose and really check things out. Um, and we use the thing about tripods have legs and so do you. So when you put down your tripod, you just don't get stuck in one position. 
But I have to say with using the Olympus and with using the 12 to 100 lens, it's a great lens for doing stuff like I was doing. And because I was hand holding, because it was so nice and small and I could really get into different positions. If you go to number three, the next image, Lisa, you'll see that I did not do one of our key things that we always tell people, and that is sweep the edges. These, the first two pictures you just saw showed you what I ended up cropping, but the last image, when it comes up, and if you sweep the edges, look at my foot in the lower left-hand corner. I did not sweep my edges and look for my toe sticking in because I was on wide angle. So when you're using all of your lenses, even if you're hand holding, make sure you do sweep your edges. Watch for things to intrude into your image that you don't want. I luckily could crop out my foot, but you know, it, it's so much fun. And, and with the Olympus, it's, it's so easy and so great out in the field now because it doesn't weigh that much. So a lot of times now I will use a monopod when I'm just especially doing wildlife. But if I am doing more stuff like this, I still use my tripod. And that's I have a question. Tip. I have a question for you, Marianne. Um, sure. When you're using a tripod, do you tend to wander around with your camera and to select your composition first and then set your tripod up, or do you like to like do you wander around and sort of set the tripod and then work within the frame after you've already arrived there? If my subject isn't moving, I'll go around first with just my camera and see what position I want to be in, what really gives me the composition that I want. Then I'll set up my tripod. But if it's a moving bird, if it's a moving subject like a bird or anything like that, I'll actually have my camera on the tripod. Might have the legs collapsed almost in a monopod position so I can move more quickly. And then I'll set it up. But in this case, when I was working with the bones, I was actually hand holding, moving around until I found the image I wanted. And then I set the tripod up. Gotcha. And do you tend to use the grid lines that you can set up in the camera to kind of help you line these things up? Or do you just visualize it sort of without having any of that in, in distraction on the frame. I just, yeah, I just visualize. I don't have it set up in the camera. I've been doing this, I think, long enough that I can kind of see, you know, in my mind, I can divide my image into the thirds. So I just do it that way. But it's, it's nice when you have the feature to do the grids that to have it there because it really does like this. It really does help you um, put things in a, in a really a point of power where your audience is drawn into that and into that. Um, interest or that part of the subject. Very cool. I love it. Thanks very much. Okay, so that was Marianne. Let's let's move on to Matt. What's Matt got for us tonight? Hey. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, I do a lot of uh, night sky workshops, and uh, we're going to be looking at a couple things here that I see that uh, people have um, kind of mistakes that people make when they're out there thinking that they need to do certain things when they're out with their night sky photographs. And um, it's funny too, because I, I used to shoot with Sony and I used to think, oh, the big full frame is, you know, that's the perfect for night sky photographs. And I had one of my students at one of my workshops have an Olympus camera and he started showing me the live comp that uh, Tom did a really good uh, job of explaining. And I was just like blown away by what you can do and just see those star trails just, uh, just forming on the back of the camera. And so that's, that was actually at that workshop that started piquing my interest in Olympus. But then I was always worried, you know, geez, you need the full frame camera for a night sky and not at all. I mean, you need a camera that you're going to have fun with and that's going to be able to go anywhere with you. And Olympus does a great job for night photography. So I just want to get that clear right off the bat. Uh, in this photo here, we're looking at a live comp shot. And this was a, uh, let's see here. This was set up in live comp. If you guys are familiar with live comp, it was set up for 20 second exposures at a 4.5 ISO 640. So I'll give you a little behind the scenes on the settings. And this was with my seven to 14 uh, millimeter f 2.8 lens. And I was able to use a lower ISO than normal because I had some moonlight behind me and that was helping to illuminate my foreground. And what I really want to talk about here was then what I did was I used a secondary light and just lit it for just a little bit to get those swirls on the right hand side. And actually, if you go out and look, um, I didn't have the loom cube back then when I photographed that, but you can get these little portable lights. I'm hoping not blinding everyone too bad here. Uh, this is a loom cube. And this is fantastic because this is a, it's called low level lighting when you're doing this type of photography. And the mistake that I see people making is that they come out with these, huge, huge lights, flashlights. Um, I, I still call them uh, potato mashers. And this kind of dates me a little bit with photography. Uh, you know, when you used to have the uh, the flash and you used to be on an L bracket and uh, 
you know, we <laughs> hated those big flashes, uh, but they were effective, but they blew the heck out of anything you were firing at. But I see people out on workshops and they're using these big, huge flashlights and just really killing their foregrounds with this. You want to really balance the light. And the cool thing with these LED lights is that you can adjust the light, you know, from really dark to really bright. You want to go with a low level light on it. And you can also adjust the color temperature too, from, from cool to warm. And that's what I did in this shot here. And I started this at the very beginning of my live comp exposure. And I knew I needed to get the light on the Swaros first. And then once I did that, I can just let the live comp run for as long as I needed to. So I probably took maybe a half a dozen or a dozen photos and just standing off camera to the side and just doing a little bit of light painting with a little bit of low light to just warm up the Swaros on the right hand side. I didn't need to worry about the ones a little bit further back. And that helped really balance this photo a lot better. And you know, you're, um, you're not seeing just a swirl that's completely blown out and too bright. And it doesn't match the, the background, doesn't match the whole scene and just looks terrible. And on the flip side, uh, let's go ahead and switch to the next image. Okay, so on the flip side here, now this is in uh, Grand Teton National Park and you can't, a lot of people don't know this, uh, but you, you're not supposed to use low level light. You're not supposed to use any light at all for light painting in the park. It's, uh, it's a rule that it seems like only us photo instructors really know about because I see people out there all the time doing it. Uh, we have to get a permit to teach out there. So I can't do that. I can't risk my permit to light things. And this was photographed on a completely, you know, there's no moon at all. So completely it can't get any darker than what it could here. So you're not gonna have any light to light up your foreground. So what you wanna try and do is look for other elements in your scene. And in this particular case here, I had the Snake River. And so what I did was I composed my image really nice so that you can get some light reflected from the stars in the river. It's a, you know, obviously it's a lot darker in the river, but you still get enough of light in there to give shape to the landscape. Uh, got a nice little, sort of like a little S-curve going right into the back of the mountains there. And the mountains fortunately had a little bit of snow on it that I was able to, the camera was still able to capture. And, you know, this was what I was talking about with full frame cameras, everyone thinks, oh yeah, the dy dynamic range, you need all this and that. And, you know, my uh, Olympus, this was with the uh, EM1 Mark X, um, did, you know, was able to pull out just enough detail. Um, in post-processing, I didn't want to bring out a whole lot more of the snow, just give it a little hint of texture and uh, be able to see a little bit of the snow in there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you, you don't need to, use lights. And I've seen some people in this particular spot that, I mean, big, huge lights, and they're trying to light the whole foreground across from the river. And it's just, it's just not going to work. It's going to give you a lousy photograph. So when you're in an area that you can't use any lights, look around, study your scene, see what's coming up visually when you do some test exposures, and then play with your composition based on, based on that. And that's what I did with getting some light in this river. Hey, Matt, a couple of questions coming across here, just talking about settings yep. for how long your, um, your live comp was, and then maybe talk yeah. a little bit about settings for, for stationary stars. Yeah, so this was, um, if I remember correctly, this was probably about 45 minutes. And so I had the live comp set for 20-second uh, exposures at f4.5. So it's, you know, doing a new image, recording new light every 20 seconds. And I think I stayed out there for about 45 minutes on that particular shot. Uh, on the other shot, so the one with the still stars, so that was shot with my eight millimeter fisheye, the eight millimeter 1.8 M Zuiko fisheye, and that was a 25 second exposure at f2.2 at ISO 4000. And so I, I usually try, I don't like shooting the stars right w wide open at, at f1.8. Sometimes you'll see in the corners of the frames, there'll be a little bit of softness in there. So even just stopping down just a hair, just a 2.2 makes a little bit of a difference on that. And, um, you know, that's usually where I'm at in terms of the, um, in terms of the exposure of the ISOs right around 4,000 or 5,000, right in that range. Uh, the, the amount of time that you want to leave your shutter open really depends on your lens. So the wider the lens is, the longer you can leave your shutter open without having the stars move. Uh, there's these formulas that, you know, they're the F, you know, the, what is it, the 60 rule or and all this stuff. I don't, forget about those rules. Honestly, just take a 20 second photo and then use your camera, just zoom right in on the image. And if you see the stars moving, your exposure is too long. Too long. So that's what I really go with by that instead of you don't have to memorize all these formulas. And then the last thing I do is I'll, I'll knock my color temperature down and I'll have it, uh, boy, probably at around, I'm just trying to see if the XF data had it on that. It, 
didn't on this, or at least on that screenshot that I did, but it's usually a little bit above tungsten. So right around the 3000, 3200 is uh, where I keep the color balance um, set for these night shots. And then here's my question for you. Have you yeah. played with Starry Sky AF and how did you autofocus or how did you manual focus this image? Yeah, so um, I, I was able to play with it a little bit when I had the uh, uh, pre-release copy of it when I was down in Arizona and I had some opportunity to photograph the uh, night sky. Up here in Montana, it's been, uh, I don't know, Eric, you can probably, uh, you know, back me up on this. A lot of times we get some cloudy nights, so it's, I haven't been able to go out recently with the Starry AF. But in my test that I was doing uh, a few months ago, it works out. It works really good. And what it seems to be doing is a process that I teach my students on how to do manually. And what it is, is you, what you do is you, you put your camera on manual focus to begin with. And then what you do is you zoom in and you're looking at the back of your screen or you can look through the camera, but you zoom in, you use the magnifying um, feature of the camera to zoom in on one of your bright stars. And then you just adjust, you start rotating your focus back and forth and you'll see when you're near infinity, you'll see your star get a little bit bigger because it's getting out of focus and then it'll get smaller. And then when it's at the smallest point is when it's gonna be in focus. So if you just keep on rotating your, your, um, your focusing ring back and forth, so you, know, you have the big blurry star, it gets nice and tight, and then it gets blurry again because you've gone past that, and then just start fine tuning your focus. And then what you do is you know, when you have that pinpoint uh, focusing on the stars, it's going to be just a little pinprick there. And that seems like what the um, Starry AF is doing. Then what I do is I'll just take some gaffer's tape and then tape that, tape my uh, focusing ring. And so that that doesn't move during my photo shoot. Gaff tape. I love it. Never go away. <laughs> no. Hey, Matt. Uh, yeah. I'd just like to emphasize what you had said about uh, lighting up that saguaro cactus first. If, when you're doing those kind of light paintings, you have to do the, the, your foreground first because otherwise you could have this beautiful star trail or something, and then you blow it with your light <laughs> and painting. And you kill so it, yep. Get your foreground correct first, like you were just saying, and I just wanted to reiterate that for people that will be listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> nothing worse than uh, messing it up. And, you know, there's been times that I I didn't mess it up and I'd be doing a long exposure and a live comp and then some car drives by and then, uh, you know, their headlights will mess it up. So you got to keep an eye out for that as well. Cool. Love it. Great tips. Okay. So next up is Lisa Merrill. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we're going to uh, switch gears to the travel side of, of things and talk about frames. One idea that we emphasize a lot on our tours and with people we teach at our home here in Seattle is to be on the lookout for frames as an interesting way to add a variety to your images and to draw your viewer's eye in. Um, in this case, uh, the door frames uh, give a, a nice contrast to the busyness outside. So you've got these, you know, diagonal lines kind of leading in and I waited for a while. It was a nice break during street photography. Uh, I'm actually in a, the entryway to a temple and um, you get a little bit of context from the flags. This, like many of the images I'll share with you now, was taken with our wide angle, the 7 to 14, 2.8 Olympus lens, which is just a real light for street photography. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see the next one. And here again, we've got a mixture of nature and architecture. And this was created um, literally on a balcony at a coffee shop through a potted plant. If anyone had seen me leave my coffee and kneel down through the balcony, but I really enjoy a way of taking up that negative space in the blue sky and having, um, in this case, the potted fern. Uh, framing a very famous landmark in Cartagena, Colombia of the, the Duomo of the Temple. So, and this was taken with the 12 to 100. I think um, Marianne mentioned that lens before, but as far as versatility, this is a, a you know, 12 100 all day I could walk and do a lot of different variety in uh, travel photography. Um, and sometimes with frames we do in focus frames and sometimes let them blur. And it's just a real one thing to keep in mind as you're uh, out exploring. Next. 
besides travel photography, John and I firmly um, believe in using our skills for, for good in our community. So we work with a fair number of nonprofits and help them tell their story, get more donors, more clients, and um, strengthen the community. In this case, it's a mobile bike repair van. And so um, I love portraiture with frames, and it's hard to do, as you can imagine. Took some patience, some developing rapport and comfort among myself and this uh, two guys I spent an afternoon with, but by just positioning myself with the wide angle and waiting for the exact moment and getting uh, the nice filtered light coming through the top of the van, I made a portrait that I love that this organization, Bike Works, has used uh, quite a lot. So, and that's also with the seven to 14. And, and then, you know, nature is near and dear to our hearts with travel photography and this was at Joshua Tree National Park, which I'm sure some of you guessed. Um, but anytime we see a great sunset, I think both John and I look for what can we silhouette? I mean, the skies are nice, but I'm always thinking about shapes. And in this case, the trees are just an endlessly fascinating shape, but it took quite a while of scouting to find pre-sunset where I might set up knowing the sunset was going to happen in that direction with a, a set of frames it adds dimensionality and depth to the image. And again, another one with the wide angle, the seven to 14. So, um, you know, I, we encourage you as you're out and about, I think of uh, photography, whether nature or urban is kind of a scavenger hunt. And I'm always noticing things, even when I don't have a camera in my hand, but frames are something to just be aware of and potentially um, use to your own uh, advantage when you're creating images. When you're talking to students who are just getting into photography, do you encourage them to go out and look for frames before they start photographing or to leave their mind open and sort of wait for frames to come to them? You know, we, I think of every single rule as a tool, a tool to use whenever. Some, some people like assignments uh, after when we teach over a, a few weeks, and I might list that as one, but... Um, more, it's just kind of we inspire with ideas and then use them at will. Um, but I do find, especially with traveling with us for a while, people start to echo and try things, whether from us or their fellow subjects. And it, it can be really fun to see people take some of these tips and use them in a way that, you know, delights me as a viewer. So tell me, like, how tenacious have you been when you find a great frame? Like you said, you're sitting there sipping coffee a couple of times. Is that one way that you kind of like maintain your tenacity in finding the picture that you're waiting for in that door frame, waiting for the perfect subject to come through? It's both that, that, that firm, the, the copy found me, like I just <laughs> kind of, how can, you know, but it was just delightful to be, I was hot, tired. I was taking a break and I'm like laughing at myself, still photographing, but it was just a fun way to look at that. And I was also up a level. So often when you're shooting up at churches, they can, that can get old, church in the sky. So, you know, especially with landmarks, it's how can I do it differently? So, but sometimes- I love the serendipity you, of it. <laughs> it's great. There's, there's a mix of planning and serendipity, exactly. But in our travel photography, we often will find a background or a framed subject and wait for an interesting, you know, sub subject, if you will, to walk into the frame or in front of a background. And my, my tip in the next round We'll go to that. The Vietnamese yeah, temple was definitely a, a quite a wait and later picking through and yet there's one I just loved the most. It had a mixture of, you know, the, the person carrying the, the uh, shoulder, shoulder weighted uh, carriers as well as the motorcycle. A lot of things with street photography come together. It's time to pick a favorite. You know, one of the things I think that the difference between pros and amateurs sometimes is just how tenacious they are about a great idea. Like if you find a great piece of light or a great frame or a great leading line, like I find that pros will work that much, much harder than people who are just getting into it. So I think that they're like, I know there's something great here. I'm willing to wait it out until the right thing comes into the frame. So that's kind of what I see in your pictures. Yeah, patience. I say that we say that a lot in mindfulness and it's, it's challenged because you always have the what's around the corner. And that's a balance we all make while exploring, even photographing in our own neighborhoods. It's kind of like, what do you stick with? But I do think uh, often sticking with it gets results and that's how you learn. So. For sure. All right, thanks very much. All right, so moving on, uh, I guess Roger, so Eric. Eric, Eric is in the hot seat. 
Okay, first image up. Um, this is an Arctic fox from Arctic Canada. And let me take a step back and talk a little bit about my photo tips before we go on a little bit further. I've been watching everybody's uh, images put up here so far, and they kind of reflect a lot of what we go into the world to photograph for. We're looking for adding impact images. So whether it's the blasting off of the birds that Joe McDonald put up, or if we're talking about, you know, getting that powerful angle on the coyote like Lidra put out for her one of her slides. One of the things I notice that kind of unifies us and brings us together is getting down, getting eye level. And it's not just with wildlife. I'd like to bring in some other things too, but leading photo trips, I think as educators, whether we're um, you know leading a photo trip or doing a workshop or doing a class, I think we all like to walk around and see the perspective everybody's taking on a particular scene. And uh, that's one of my favorite things to do is interact with people while they're photographing and often say, hey, just what if you just drop down a little bit more and take a look at this from a lower angle, look at how what happens to the scene. And so uh, I'm going to explore that a little bit getting down lower and also explore how Olympus has allowed me to do this even easier. Um, so let's go ahead, second, second slide, please. Um, here, you know, a king penguin walking across some rocks on South Georgia Island. I think Joe and Marianne McDonald were on this, uh, probably just down the beach from me the day I took this photograph. Here I'm getting so low, I'm actually setting the camera right on the gravels of the beach there to get this beautiful angle as the, the king penguin tops the hill right there in front of me. So again, this low angle puts me down, gives me a more intimate feel with my wildlife subject. And uh, we're going to explore not just wildlife subjects, but also some other subjects as well. So next slide, please, Lisa. Thank you. And this doesn't have to be an exotic location like in the high Arctic tundra or down in South Georgia Island or um, any place in the world. This could be in your backyard. In fact, this is in the backyard here at, at the office. I can see the spot where I took this photograph right out my window here. Just a black-tailed deer, uh, a doe black-tailed deer walked out of the trees. And all I did is I laid my camera right down on the ground so I could shoot through the grasses and the, the wildflowers as well as uh, looks like there might even be some dandelions in there. So just shot right through them. And what I've learned by doing this, not only do I get a more intimate portrait, but oftentimes if it's in a situation where the, you know, it's a, a species you can you know, do this with and you can do it safely, is they often, it piques their curiosity. So you often get this interaction where they're exploring what you're doing while you're photographing too. And it often gives you, um, whether it's a deer in this situation, red fox. When I'm out photographing red fox, a lot of times if I'm down close to the ground, they feel less worried about approaching me. And they actually will stop for a minute and maybe check you out and give you that eye contact you're looking for for a more powerful image. So you pique their curiosity as well. Now, we'll always talk about anytime you're out on a workshop or a photo trip, we'll talk about safety and when you can do that. One of my favorite things is keeping an eye on everybody, make sure they're safe in those situations too. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Um, some places, you know, it's hard to just kind of walk up and stand there five and a half feet and get the photograph that you want. Most people do that. They, they get off their, off their landing craft, they, they come off their safari vehicle, or they walk down the trail and they stand there and they take their picture right at about a five and a half foot level. Well, there are places where maybe you can't do that. In this case, it's a tufted puffin on, in the Pribilof Islands. I, the particular cliff I was on, looking back along it, you couldn't quite see the bird very well. So I had to edge out and by getting down lower, I was a lot safer. And I could put my camera out a little bit further off and kind of frame it through some of the lupin flowers to give it that nice soft purpley glow around it. It's almost like using your surrounding vegetation as a bit of a um, filter, it gives you a little bit of a color filtering there. So let's go ahead and talk about where Olympus comes into the picture here on this one. Now, if you're like me, and there's a, I'm a little bit older, I've been into photography for a long time. Back in the film days, we didn't have rear screens. And early on, we didn't even have rear screens that flipped out. And, you know, to be honest with you, I was kind of an old dog and new tricks didn't come very easy to me. So initially, I didn't use my back screen to the to the point that I use it today. Uh, the Olympus back screen is so bright and uh, it's large enough, it's bright enough, it works well in almost all light that I'll flip that out oftentimes. And I'll actually use that as my composition tool. And I don't have to hold the camera at eye level, I'll actually drop it down maybe below waist level, um, like an old twin lens reflex or something like that, or then maybe even put it right down on the ground. And not only with that flip screen now, but something that works really well with the Olympus cameras, the touch screen. 
Now, initially, I turned my touch screen off. I didn't want to mess with it. I thought, oh, I'm going to end up touching it at the wrong time. I'll lose focus, maybe change my settings. But since I've learned how nice this particular um, uh, technique is, I keep it on almost all the time. And I actually had to go into my menu system. I believe on most of the OMD cameras, it's J1. Just go into the gear into J1, set that to enable your back screen. And then you can't see it here. I've got my wife helping me out with the, the composition here, but right underneath her knuckle is a little um, button you can tap on there to turn the touch screen on and off. And I often just keep mine enabled if I need to. I flip out the back screen, drop the camera down, touch where I want it to focus, and it automatically takes the photograph right there. So it focuses almost instantaneously, and you, you get sharp focus, and you take the picture at the same time. If you're shooting in continuous mode, keep your finger on that spot on the touch screen, it takes the photo. So um, yeah, it's one of my favorite things to do now. And let's go ahead on to the next. I'll show you a little bit more about my technique as modeled by Melissa, my talented wife. Uh, here we are at one of our local ponds here on the islands. And you can see, this is even with the, the 300 F4. She's, she's not a big person. Uh, she's able to just kind of reach down, cradle the camera, put it right down at eye level with the water. And using the touch screen, put that touch where she wants the camera to focus and take the picture instantaneously. And it really does work very well that way. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works in your favor through some of the images now. Right. Same pond, different time, but same pond with a hooded merganser. Um, watching, waiting, trying to keep that camera right down at water level, you know, right? So it's just skimming across water and look what happens. You get this beautiful halo of light and out of focus highlights behind them. And you've got this nice smooth lead up and it isolates your subject. So it really gives you that impact. It connects with your subject like that. Just in this case, waiting for a little bit of displaying behavior, touch the screen and snap, it photographs. So one of my favorite things to do, keeping it down as close. And let's use another example if we can go to the next slide. Here, um, my boss's little, uh, I like to call it his frog pond. I saw some bullfrogs hanging out in it. So I just kind of edged up to it slowly so I wouldn't disturb him. I actually held the camera down right next to the water. I couldn't have done this any other way, but holding the camera, I, the, this again, 300 millimeter, just skimming right across the water. The barrel of the lens is almost in the water at this point. And I just touch on the back screen, take a few shots, maybe recompose a little bit, take a couple more shots, and I had plenty of good sharp images just by using that touch screen. Very reliable. I think I was using this on the EM1 Mark. Th yeah, this is the Mark III. So very, very good system. Very tight. Very quick focusing, and great way to get those in those low angle images. Thank you, Lisa. Next slide, please. Ah, so we're not just limited to wildlife. Think about when you, you know. Again, I'm not as young as what I used to be. Uh, so getting down, laying on the ground, and trust me, uh, when I came back from a photo shoot, if I was covered in mud or with grass seeds, things like that, I felt like I actually did something. Uh, nowadays, it's not as hard to be rolling around on the ground, and especially getting up from that particular pot, that position. So where I can kneel down, lay the camera across the ground, like in this case with some glacier lilies, touch where, right where I want to focus there on that lower flower, let the camera the camera focus almost instantaneously takes the picture. That's a lot easier for me to do nowadays at my age, but at the same time, um, I can still keep at it. I can still keep shooting. So not only is it giving me this creative tool, but it makes what I used to do a heck of a lot easier. And here, another situation where all the out of focus flowers, since I'm shooting through like this, this uh, natural garden of glacier lilies, all those out of focus flowers that I'm shooting through and they're behind the, behind my subject, just really add a, that extra color and life and color filtration to it. So it works with a lot of different subjects, not just wildlife. Uh, we can go ahead to the next image, please. Also, uh, not only with different subjects, uh, yeah, macro, my goodness, macro is a lot of fun this way. You can get it, your camera in up underneath a leaf or a blossom to get some photographs. I do this a lot of times with the macro. And it gives me an opportunity to get into awkward positions where, you know, I qu couldn't normally do it. Uh, in this case, how about think about all the different lenses. I showed you, oh, let's see, the, the, if I remember correctly, the, the Lily right before this, it was taken with the 40 to 150. I showed you some shots taken with the 300 F4. Uh, this particular image was taken with that 8, that eight millimeter 1.8. Um, by the way, when you, if you're ever out in a situation where you're in a field of flowers or a meadow or something like that, and you put that lens on, 
it's hard to take it off. It's just so much fun to go exploring. This is just some balsam root. Uh, I was back and visiting Montana not too long ago and the balsam root were blooming. So I wanted to see how close I could get in with that eight millimeter and lowering it down where I couldn't get down low enough and just using the same technique, using the flip out screen, getting it down to where I found my, my composition and touch the back screen and it takes the pictures. By the way, this also was focus stack too. So in camera focus stacking, you can use that with same, you know, some of these same techniques can be applied just using that touch screen. And all of a sudden you're working hard, but not quite as hard as what you would have done before. Uh, this is right out of right out of camera. And I don't even think I ran this through Photoshop or anything. I maybe ran it through my app on my phone. So I just downloaded this right off the Olympus camera onto the app and processed it from there. So just having some fun and trying not to take myself too seriously in the touch screen really gives me that opportunity. Um, so I think that's it. Other than maybe how about, uh, yeah, why don't we give you a little bit of a plug for, you know, the one thing we like to do when we're doing these, uh, these education um, scenarios is whether we're doing it as a classroom or we're out in the field or on a photo trip, you know, this is a great place to learn about these different techniques right hand, right there and know when to apply them and also share with other people. It might be uh, exploring the photographic world from the same level you are. So thank you, Lisa, for leading me through my slideshow there. Any questions, Matt? No, we don't. No, that was a great job that you did on that, Eric. And uh, no questions on that yet, though, but uh, great tips on that. Okay, thanks. Cool. End of round one. Very nice. <laughs> All right, guys. Same well, way too. <laughs> if, um, let's uh, let's go ahead and move on here. Back to Joe McDonald for his second tip. Yeah, if, if the fourth picture can get uh, lined up with the second or the first picture, the comparisons will be easier. There you go. So I wanted to talk about focus stacking. Nice segue there, Eric. And welcome, my focus friend. Focus stacking. Uh, you have your choice of two different ways to do it. You can have the, uh, uh, the camera do the focus stack automatically as, as Eric was talking about, and it makes a composite JPEG, or you can also do it where you use Zarene Stacker or Helicone Focus or something like that, and you put it together yourself. But most of the time, in fact, all, every, I haven't used it any other way, but with the uh, automatic mode, Nonetheless, when you're shooting a focus stack, you still have your, uh, each individual image. So if you needed to, you could always overlay one of the shots and mask it in if for one reason or another, if there'd be something that would be uh, maybe a little bit blurred or whatever. I was shooting a salamander just the other day and its color, its throat patch was moving back and forth and in the composite then, the, uh, it was just a little bit blurred along that edge. If you can imagine me, and it's probably pretty easy to do as a salamander. So this was moving back and forth and a little bit blurred. So I could have used one of the other shots and overlaid it and then masked, masked that in. But here's what I wanted to illustrate with this focus stacking. When we're thinking of depth of field, we often use small apertures. And when we're using small apertures, as you can see with that picture on the left, even though the background may not be sharp, you'll still have a background that will have like a parent sharpness to it, and it can be distracting. So you can see the comparison here where they're both focus stacking shots, but the one on the right, I shot it, I think at F5.6. The one on the left, I shot it at 16 or 22. And focusing in just a little bit, because again, if the camera is doing it, it focuses, Wherever you focus, it starts stacking. Let's say you have uh, 15 shots in your, in your focus stack. Number eight shot, or seven, is where you focus, and then seven in front of it, and seven behind it. So you end up with uh, near and far. But if you have a very narrow focus differential, and you're using F5.6, for example, you will have and you might have to do this more than once to make sure you're getting the, the results you want, but you'll have only the flower shop sharp and the background is still blurred as it would be at F4. If we go to the next one, you'll see the same, uh, another example of that. 
So the next, two shots. the next two shots. So if you can put up uh, the close up of those two flowers. Okay, so here again, it, it was a much tighter shot of the, uh, the pink lady slipper. And the background on the left, I would argue, is pretty distracting there, whereas the one on the right has that, that bokeh look, that soft look. And yet those, those uh, lady slippers, and there was a two inch difference between the front one and the back one. Even if I used F22 and didn't use focus stacking, and I did it just to, to uh, prove a point, both flowers could not be sharp. At this working distance, your depth of field is just too shallow. But even though it wouldn't have been sharp, I'd still have that background on the left that is distracting. So my tip on this is to use a, uh, depending on what you're trying to do, if you want to isolate your subject, use a aperture that might be closer to wide open, f4, 5, 6, somewhere around there. And you have you will have then a background that is blurred and not distracting. I just did an ebook on this that's available from eJunkie on focus stacking, and I did a uh, basically a five part series on this. It was one long video, but Joe, I took your advice about cutting them down, so my my twenty five minute video became four videos of seven minutes each that went through the entire process because with focus stacking you have a couple of things you gotta be worried about or concerned with. One is the number of shots and the other is the focus differential. And those seem to be, you know, you, people figure that out pretty quickly, but what you don't think about is that roll of aperture to get the effect you want to have, which in this case for me was that shallow one. And the YouTube channel is Wildlife and Nature with Joe and Marianne McDonald. Matt, I saw there was a, a question for Joe on the one thing. Could you read it back to him? Matt? I put another guy to sleep. Joe? <laughs> I think Matt may have jumped off because we got his thumbnail right now. So hold on. Let me see if I can find it. This is in the chat. It was something, it was something about somebody was told when focus stacking to photo to focus halfway in or something. I couldn't read it because I didn't have my glasses on. Yeah, that, that's the thing. And this this is the one really annoying thing for me with the, uh, the Olympus focus stacking, which is such a wonderful feature. If you're using it where the camera sets up the, the, uh, the, the, the composite, makes a composite at the end of it, you have to focus kind of like in the middle because it's gonna take those seven frames if we're doing 15, the seven frames in front, then skip the one that you focused on and do the seven frames behind. If you do it manually, if you don't have it that the camera is going to make the composite JPEG, then you focus on the very front and each subsequent shot stacks back behind it. And I would love to have that for the, uh, the automatic feature too, because then there'd be no question that I'm starting at the very front of that flower and everything works back from there. Otherwise, it is a bit of guesswork. And uh, uh, the guesswork is truly kind of a no-brainer because it seems like it's always worked for me. But I would much prefer to have that, that uh, degree of control focusing the front. That being said, it has worked so well, I haven't bothered with doing a Zareen stacker or helicone focus manual stacking. The camera does a great job. Awesome, I love it. All right, Matt, you're back. Anything, we answered one question about focus points there, but was there anything else that you saw? Yeah, no, not seeing anything else over here. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm gonna uh, stick with uh, something uh, a little bit more on the practical side instead of the artistic, but one of the things that I have to do a lot uh, as a wedding portrait and event photographer is share images. And there's uh, one workflow tip that I absolutely adore that makes my life so much easier. And that is that a lot of times when people want to move an image from their phone to, or from their camera to their phone, they will connect OI share to their camera and then scroll through the entire card full of images looking for the one that they want to transfer and post. 
And this takes a tremendous amount of time and resources and things like that. Instead of doing that, I find it's far more efficient, far faster to go ahead and tag images on the back of the camera using the share icon, which is right there on the screen. It's that little green sort of arrow where it says raw right there. That little icon will show up on the playback on the screen as you're playing back images. If you tap that little icon, you can tag as many photos as you want. Then as soon as you connect OI share to your phone, it will transfer just those images across. You didn't have to look through anything. You've got just the ones you want. And it saves all that time, creates all that efficiency in your workflow so that you get the images onto your phone that you want to post and nothing else. Now, one other tip I have for this is that if you are a raw shooter like I am most of the time, then you can actually do raw conversions in camera and then tag those JPEGs and move them across. Sometimes when I'm working really, really quickly, I might not have the perfect white balance set for my raw file. And what I will do is go into the playback menu, find the raw file I want to transfer, go ahead and do a conversion just by hitting the OK button on the back of the camera. And if I need to tweak that white balance, which is you know, 99% of the time, the thing that I might want to tweak with a raw file, I can do that and create a custom JPEG, tag that JPEG, and then send it over to my phone. So that will save you a tremendous amount of time, hopefully make that process that much quicker, because there's no bigger pet peeve in the world of cell phones for me than someone who has a tremendously wonderful camera system, and all they post on their social media is things from their phone and never from their Olympus camera. This, this process really doesn't have to be that painful, and it can be so much quicker if you use the share button on the back of the camera to tag the images that you want. That's my tip on that, guys. That's an awesome tip. I love connecting the cameras wirelessly to the iPhone or iPad. And boy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use, I'm learning a whole lot here myself. Yes. So, uh. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, me too. <laughs> All right, so uh, I guess we're going back to, Lidra's got a second tip for us. Yeah, I do. So um, one of my absolute favorite features of these Olympus cameras is HDR the in-camera HDR. Now I have a lot of people who are actually surprised that I use it as much as I do, but I, I use the heck out of that, um, that feature a lot. So um, this is only one image that I put up. I could have probably put, you know, 50, but I just kind of want to give you an idea of when I decide I want to use this feature. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, HDR stands for high dynamic range. And it's basically the camera taking four different photos and taking the best parts of each of one of those photos at different exposures and then putting them together into one photo. Now I used to have to do this in a separate um, editing program that would actually put these images together for me before I started shooting Olympus and then they had this in, in the camera. Um, and a lot of times over the past, especially early on, HDR images I would notice could get, I call it crunchy, they just kind of look a little bit too overcooked sometimes. Um, and a lot of these programs would do that. But when I started shooting with the Olympus uh, in-camera feature, I have found that I get some pretty natural looking images. I'm actually surprised at how well the camera does this and uh, does it in camera. Um, now, there are two, uh, HDR1 and HDR2. So there are two different modes there. And the second one actually takes, um, takes the images over a larger range. So if you've got something like really, really high contrast uh, scene in front of you, you might want to use two. But 95% of the time I use HDR1 because it just looks a little more natural. Um, so that's most of the time what I use. Now, <laughs> the EM1 Mark II, I used to love it because the feature was right here on a button on the top of the camera. Now the EM1 Mark III, which I love, don't get me wrong. Um, I was a little disappointed, though, that they took off my button. So what I did, because I'm a big fan of having things um, where I want them, I went in and I changed one of my buttons here to be able to pull up HDR. So it's an automatic. Um, I don't have to go into the menu to find it each time now. But so this is sort of an image that if you kind of look, so you've got a lot of um, different tones in here. You've got some of the whites, some of the paint on the walls, and then you've also got some darks. You've got the blacks of the cannon, and also in the very, very back, that was quite dark back there, if you're just looking at it or shooting just a one-shot um, um, deal. But something like this, it actually pulls all of those tones out, but still makes it look pretty natural. Uh, one thing that I do, which is kind of, it's sort of my backup. I always shoot raw. No, no matter what I do. So if you are actually shooting raw and you're using the HDR feature, it will save 
the, the JPEG, which is the combined four exposures, the JPEG that the camera puts together for you, but it'll also save one raw shot. So for me, not every single time I use HDR do I decide that that's what I want to use um, uh, of, the, of the final image. Sometimes I choose to use the raw single shot, but if I'm always in raw, it gives me both. And so when I go back to edit, I get to see which one looks better and which one looks more natural. Um, now, don't get me wrong, you still have to edit for the most part in these images. Uh, you still have to take it in, maybe do a little bit of contrast. But sometimes, most of the time, I have to add a little bit of contrast because that's pretty much what HDR is doing, is taking away most of the contrast. But, um, you know, a little bit of sharpening, a little bit of maybe saturation, that sort of thing. You still do the normal edits that you would do, but um, you just have a better image to work with as far as having more range and keeping detail in your brights and in your darks. So this to me is, is, is one of the best features of this camera. I absolutely love it and I've used it since it came out. Um, and um, I use it with all sorts of situations. Landscape, you see the architecture here. Um, yeah, pretty much anything outdoor or even indoor. So I use it a lot and it's if you haven't played with it, I would, I would start playing with it. So. Very cool, I love it. All right, so moving on, we have Lisa has got a tip for us. So I'm going to talk about light painting. So light painting is where you use a variety of different uh, flashlights, uh, go boat flashlights. We make custom flashlights out of uh, plumber's tubing. We paint them black and so we can kind of get right angles to it. And basically you can do these, you know, outdoors. So certainly if you find a nice old car, in this case, we uh, found a, a farmer that gave us permission to go on his property at night and we light painted this, uh, this tractor at night. But this was last June and right now we would have been back in the Palouse where this was taken, but you can also do this inside. So a lot of people think of light painting as only landscape and old cars and things like that, but you can certainly do this inside as well. So the image on the left is just a straight image, you know, whatever, one two hundredth of a second inside. The image on the right probably took about five minutes. I had a very small flashlight with, again, a piece of uh, plumber's uh, tubing on there. So we just, you know, went to the hardware store and we spray painted some, uh, you know, L, you know, right angle brackets um, with black spray paint. And we just go around each one of these pieces and you can see what you're doing. So we do this on live composite. And you can actually watch as you're painting this in. So as you're going over something, you see that light come right up and it just gives a, a more rich feeling. Um, you really get something that almost looks almost Rembrandt-y and painted and almost a little bit more saturated. Uh, the image on the left is, you know, again, a straight image. The image on the right is light painted. So again, it takes on this super saturated, you know, look. You get to be able to put your shadows in there and the shadows provide a lot of depth. A lot of times things that are just kind of flat lit look flat and light painted things really add on this whole nother dimension. But right now, maybe we still can't get out even to interesting, uh, you know, an abandoned place like this. So you can even do this right in your house. So on my dryer right now, I have a $5 scientific trifold black uh, background and a piece of black, uh, you know, underneath just uh, at the dollar store, a piece of black mat. And before Tom kind of cooks our food, I will light paint the food. So these uh, can even be done during the day with uh, live composite. I just put this on a half a second. So normally if I'm outside at night, I might have something that's a 10 second uh, live composite. Um, but you can over a five minute period with a half a second, even during daylight, our laundry room isn't extremely bright, but it's in the middle of the day. I just get to have that scientific trifold up there and just add the light where I want to. And these could be a minute to five minute exposures and they just make everything kind of look really interesting. So don't be afraid that just because maybe you're home right now and can't go on the trip that you want to play around with all these things and have fun with it. So yeah, Lisa, those are, uh, those are awesome. Uh, you go. <laughs> <laughs> you're decomposing your dinner and then eat and Instagramming it. I think you're really <laughs> elevating your game here. I'm liking this. I'm getting hungry thinking about it. Uh, I have a quick yeah. question though. Are, are you shooting this, are you, when they, the initial frame in your live composite, is it completely dark? Or are you letting any artificial light in like you're just there is, like, totally so, closing down? 
So when I do this in my studio when, before COVID, um, I would try to get it as dark as possible, try to be in a completely dark room. At home, I don't have any completely dark rooms. So there is a little bit of ambient light and that you know half a second exposure will just kind of capture that ambient light and then no more ambient light comes in. So I make sure I'm kind of underexposing. So there's basically no artificial light with my flashlight for that first shot, um, but there's a little bit of ambient light. And I actually did a little video showing like bulb mode where you couldn't do this in the middle of the day to be able to light paint in a room that had windows and ambient light. But with live composite, it kind of freezes that ambient light. As long as your first picture is a little underexposed, then the only light that's coming in is going to be the light from my flashlight. So you're trying for as much underexposure as possible, but are you shooting all, like aperture closed down all the way to like 22 or are you keeping yeah, it? I'm about F11-ish, somewhere in the middle. Okay, cool. And if you don't, uh, can't get out to Home Depot to make a you know, right angle, um, one of those extra toilet paper rolls, just cut the end off of it and kind of make a diagonal line on it and then just take that black efforts tape around it and you can make a nice little snoot. Yeah, and Lisa, cool. I wanted to say, I mean, these are awesome, awesome photos. But I mean, the other thing is too, I mean, how much fun is doing this? I mean, yes. this is something that, you know, you, you can't do this with any other camera system. And I mean, you know, just being able to do something that you just can't do any other way photographically and come up with such amazing photos like this. I mean, it's, it, it's just, it is it's just fun. a blast. Even when you're outside and you're doing this, you know, normally on a regular camera, you'd be looking at a black screen on the back of your camera. And meanwhile, when the light comes in, you're seeing this. We were out in Arizona and we were light painting and the only owner's son was there on the property gave us permission to get on and uh, he came around and you know Tom's light painting and Tom goes over and light paints one of the headlights and the guy's like whoa and then Tom light paints the other headlight and the guy's like whoa because you can see it on the back of the camera so fun is the operative word it, it's a lot more mm -hmm. fun to be able to do it because it's kind of like a Polaroid meets digital world and that you're seeing it develop real time yeah great shots thanks awesome well Last but not least, we have John Merrill with our final tip of the night. I'm excited. Well, fun is a, a great segue into um, our second tip, which is intentional camera movement. Um, a really, really fun technique. Um, so basically what the idea is that you're moving your camera um, and or your lens uh, in different ways to create dynamic images to try to depict um, the world moving in the world around us. Um, here, uh, the first couple of examples of I, ha I have is a panning, which um, uses a slow shutter speed um, and then moving the camera and the lens at the speed of your subject to give a background. And we talked a little bit about previously about picking a background and being patient um, to get the shot we really want. And this is something Lisa and I do a, a lot is we pick an interesting background like, like um, a street on the Malacan in Havana and wait for interesting cars to come by. Um, so again, the idea is using the um, shutter priority mode on, on your camera, dialing in a relatively slow shutter speed. In this case, it was about a 30th, 30th of a second because the car is relatively slowly um, here on the Malacan. And then pivoting your upper body at the same speed as the subject as it moves by. And it's really important. One tip is it's really important to follow through just like you would swing in a baseball bat. It's really important to keep following through as you're, as you're panning. Um, why don't we go to the second one? So here we're, uh, I'm in Hoi An um, in Vietnam, and um, this is a place I can't wait to get back to uh, next April, where we're leading a workshop. It's one of the most, yeah, hopefully, uh, COVID allowing. Uh, one of the most photogenic places uh, in, in Vietnam. It's just wonderful. And here again, I. I picked this back background, this beautiful yellow wall with the multicolored um, paper lanterns hanging. And this is a street where it's not open to motorized vehicles. So there's a lot of bicycle traffic. And I, I sat there, I must've sat there probably for 45 minutes, just waiting for the right bicyclist to come along. And this is a technique where you 
you know, you delete a lot of images to get the one that really, really works. So this is a, a really, really fun technique. Um, and we actually have one of our custom my sets set up for panning so we can quickly dial our camera's uh, mode dial to C3, which is our panning, our panning mode. We have all of the all of the settings memorized in that my set to do this. We have um, you know autofocus. We have the okay. continuous um, burst mode, so you can take a lot of images quickly. Um, and auto, we use auto ISO so that. Um, we get, we'll get the correct shutter speed no matter what, you know, what the light is. Um, so in the third image I have here is a different type of intentional camera mu uh, movement. Um, I did this up um, in the mountains here uh, this spring. And this is a really long exposure. It's hand had four seconds. Um, obviously I had my wonderful Olympus image stabilization on. And for the first roughly three seconds of this exposure, I held the camera still. And then during the last second of the exposure, I zoomed to get the swirling effect that you see here. So it's combining traditional still photography with, with ICM for some unusual uh, effect. Okay, if you go to the fourth image, please. And here, this is, this is similar. Um, so this is, this is actually in the Chihuly Glass Museum in Seattle, which is wonderful. Whenever you, people come to Seattle, I highly encourage people to go there. It's a great photo uh, opportunity, just full of great photo opportunities. But here's a situation where I had a relatively long exposure, I think about a third or a half of a second. And I just twisted my camera slowly to create this sort of painterly effect um, without zooming, as opposed to the previous image where I zoomed and twisted the camera at the same time. So intentional camera movement, um, there's so many different ways to get creative photos using intentional camera muted, it's a really, really fun technique. And it's just something to go out and just play with. And, and as I said, you know, you'll delete a lot of images before you get one you like, but when you do get one, it's really, really fun. And that's it. Very cool. Beautiful stuff, you guys. I love it. Yeah, All right, so I think we've gotten through our tips. We now have open Q&A, and Matt is watching the chat, and also anybody who is raising their hand for a video question for any of the educators here, we'd love to help you with any question you've got for a few minutes. So if anybody's got something, now is the time. Yeah, we did have one question from Sandy asking Lisa if there was a uh, video that you made of the uh, technique. Yes, um, oh, of the technique. Um... I, I didn't post that video yet, um, but I did do a comparison of um, basically bulb mode, kind of showing that light continues to increase versus live composite. So I have not uh, posted that video yet. It's on my to-do list. Okay. All right, now that I'm not seeing any questions yet, that means everyone did such a fabulous job explaining everything that you mm -hmm. haven't uh, <laughs> caused anyone to have any questions here. So. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, now's the time. If you want to raise your hand or ask any questions in the chat, go right ahead. And I have Lisa, unmuted I think you mentioned that um, for people to know that you're going to be posting our websites and places where they can find videos like what you're talking about, you're going to do that they'll be able to find them later on. So Matt actually did post that. He posted both the link to our, all of our websites and the link to our educators Facebook group as well. Let me see if I can pull that up. Yeah, I didn't do the uh, link to individual websites, but the one to the Facebook group, uh, Facebook page, and the one to uh, the Get Olympus website, which I then think has links to our uh, to our websites from Get Olympus. Between the two, you should be able to find all of us. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think I have, do I have that one? I don't think I do. 
In addition to questions, we would love to hear from any of you suggestions for future panels, kind of tips you'd like to hear more of, perhaps genres of photography. We have between you, you don't even, you probably see half of us here tonight, but we enjoy each other and, and are planning a whole series of it. So we'd love to hear suggestions from any of you watching. We took their breath away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any questions coming in. Um, so, Joe, I think you might want to uh, walk us away here. Yeah, thanks everyone for participating. Thanks for everyone who is watching. Hopefully there's be a lot more faces and uh, eyeballs on this in the replay. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys in future events. If you guys have questions, hit us up on Facebook or even get right to us via our individual emails if you go to the Get Olympus page. So thank you guys for being here tonight. Thank you to all the educators for participating. And we will see you all in the next one. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank nice you. Job, thank you. Thanks.